Hey guys, I want to welcome you guys back to another episode of Med School Mondays with Promo. That's me. Uh, today, Promo is down in the left hand corner because you know what? We actually have a lot to cover today. It's a big topic, and like promised from last video, today's topic is antidiuretic hormone. We're specifically going to talk about this pathological condition called diabetes insipidus. So you know what, let's get right into it. So antidiuretic hormone abbreviated over here, ADH, is also called vasopressin. So don't forget that. Antidiuretic hormone is again produced in the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus. It is brought to the posterior pituitary gland by these specific specialized channels called the neurofeasins. So in the posterior pituitary gland, that's where this uh, ADH vasopressin is hanging out. Now it's going to stay there until it's actually needed. And what does it respond to? It responds to changes in the serum osmolality levels. So when the serum osmolality levels get too high, guess what? The posterior pituitary gland is going to release the antidiuretic hormone. Do you guys know where the antidiuretic hormone works? So the antidiuretic hormone works on the late distal convoluted tubule as well as the collecting tubules. And what you want to remember for sure is that it works specifically on the principal cells. The principal cells. Don't forget the principal cells. And it works via this V2 receptors. What's the function of antidiuretic hormone? Well, just what it sounds like, antidiuretic hormone, meaning antidiuresis. You don't want to urinate all these fluids out. So the antidiuretic hormone works on this uh, specific portion in the nephrons. And what does it do? It's retaining all the water back into the serum, as much as water as it can. So what you guys got to remember is so that you can do well on these board questions, is uh, the normal serum osmolality levels as well as the urine osmolality levels. You got to keep that in mind. You don't want to forget it. So the serum osmolality levels, normal values range from 250 to about 290 milliosmoles per kilogram. The urine osmolality levels range from uh, uh, anywhere over 800 milliosmoles per kilogram. Now what we talk about is, well, what happens when antidiuretic hormone is not either uh, produced properly or is not working on the kidney properly? And that's what diabetes insipidus is referred to. So first of all, in diabetes insipidus, what's going on? Like we said, there's a, you know, there's going to be a condition that's not allowing either antidiuretic hormone not to be produced or antidiuretic hormone is not going to be able to work on the kidneys. Whatever the situation is, the patient is going to present with these two symptoms right over here. Polyuria and polydipsia. Polyuria means excessive urination and polydipsia means excessive thirst. And that naturally makes sense. The more a patient urinates, the more thirsty he or she's going to get. So he or she's going to drink more and more water. So what do we got over here? We got a patient who has polydipsia and polyuria. So right now, you know, we don't know anything else about the patient. But of course, we're, uh, we're doctors, so we want to do some investigations. So what do we do? We check the osmolality levels. Now we already know what this normal serum osmolality should be and the normal urine osmolality should be. So we check uh, the patient's osmolality levels. So we check the osmolality levels and they come back in this range over here. The serum osmolality levels are pretty high and the urine osmolality levels are pretty low. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, is not working for some reason. And that's why the serum osmolality levels have started to rise. So anywhere above the, you know, the above the 290 range. And we know the urine osmolality levels are quite uh, low at this point. So you could say, uh, you know, it'll get low down to about 150, about 200. Now we think about what are the causes? What is causing this ADH not to be working? Well, there's two main sort of categories you gotta think about. You gotta think about issues that happen up in the brain as well as issues that happen down at the level of the kidneys. If it happens up in the brain, we refer to this as central diabetes insipidus. If it happens in the level of the kidneys, we refer to it as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So let's start off with central diabetes insipidus because it's happening in the brain. Think about conditions that can affect the brain. You know, there could be a, the patient could have been in a serious accident. The patient could have gone under some sort of trauma. Uh, the patient could have had some sort of infection, uh, in, uh, some sort of infection such as what syphilis, tuberculosis, infiltrative disease such as sarcoidosis. Perhaps a tumor could have affected the patient. Some ischemic changes, uh, for example, a stroke. The patient may have had some hemorrhagic issues, uh, bleeds in the brain. So for whatever reason, this, uh, the supraoptic nuclei is either not producing the antidiuretic hormone or the posterior pituitary gland is not able to release it. So what happens? Antidiuretic hormone is not released. It never makes its way down to the kidneys 
and guess what the water never gets retained back into the serum so of course we expect our serum osmolality levels to be high of course we expect our urine osmolality levels to be low so the patient is unable to concentrate their urine which means that they're uh, urinating dilute urine so now we think about well what happens if the brain is actually doing its part so let's see the brain did its part the supraoptic nucleus made the antidiuretic hormone it got brought to the posterior pituitary gland the posterior pituitary gland released the antidiuretic hormone uh, in normal amounts when it was meant to so then what happens it makes its way down to the kidneys but guess what now there's something at the level of the kidneys that's preventing the antidiuretic hormone from working on its uh, specific uh, uh, cells or specific receptors so what's going on we got to think about issues that are happening at the kidneys so we break this down into a couple different things as well just like we talked about with the central diabetes insipidus we talk about conditions that are affecting the kidney and that's why we call it nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so what's going on we've mentioned a couple medications over here we got lithium and demyclocycline in case you don't already know lithium is a medication used for bipolar patients again we'll discuss that in our psychiatry lectures demyclocycline another medication that you're going to be familiarized with soon and when I mean soon, I mean next week, actually. We're going to do, talk about demyclocycline in, next, in our next video. So demyclocycline is an antagonist of antidiuretic hormone. Well, why would someone need an antagonist at the antidiuretic hormone receptor? So think back to med school, but in case you don't remember, that's okay, because our next video, we're going to discuss this anyways. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, S-I-A-D-H. In those patients, there's too much ADH being secreted, so we use demyclocycline. Now, as a side effect, demyclocycline overblocks those receptors. So, antidiuretic hormone can't work on the receptors, presenting with this whole concept over here with the serum osmolality again being way too high, the urine osmolality levels being way too low. Okay? Second category, second category affecting the kidneys, electrolyte imbalances. So we think about hypercalcemia and hypokalemia. Again, an increase in calcium or a very, very low amount of potassium. The third category is kidney disease. Anything that's messing up the kidneys is going to cause the antidiuretic hormone not to act on the receptors. So what can you think about? There's so many, just a few at the top of my head. I can think of a sickle cell disease. I can think of amyloidosis. I can think of multiple myeloma. I can think of uh, pyelonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis. So any kidney disease affecting the nephrons is not gonna allow it to respond to antidiuretic hormone. Again, the patient's gonna present the same. Polyuria, polydipsia, same labs. So now the question becomes, how do we tell the difference between central diabetes insipidus and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? But before I tell you the answer, we've got to introduce our third friend over here, primary polydipsia. Now who is primary polydipsia? Let me, let me come down this way a little bit. Primary polydipsia patient, well, first of all, what's going on with the primary polydipsia patient? The primary polydipsia patient is going to present with the same two symptoms. Great, even more headache for us, right? So polyuria and polydipsia. Again, this patient is going to be urinating a lot and drinking lots and lots of water. The interesting thing with this patient, primary polydipsia, he or she will most likely be having an underlying psychogenic cause. So definitely read the question stem. Well, now that we know that there's a third guy, let's see how that affects our lab values over here on the right. So what's going on? We have this primary polydipsia patient, as you can see on the bottom over here. Well, again, this patient is going to be urinating a lot and that urine is going to be very dilute. So the lab values for the urine osmolarity section is going to be the same for, for all three of them. Primary polydipsia, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, as well as central diabetes insipidus. The difference is right over here. In primary polydipsia patient, the serum osmolality levels will actually be very, very low. And why? Because the patient... There's nothing wrong with the patient's antidiuretic hormone. So the hypothalamus is still making the antidiuretic hormone. The antidiuretic hormone is still being released and the antidiuretic hormone still gets a chance to work on the kidneys. So you can see how that lab value over there will be different from the other two over here. Okay, so awesome. Now we got the osmolalities for all the three diseases over here. We got 
we understand the causes. Now we got to figure out, well, how do we tell each one of them apart? And of course, it's kind of tricky with just based off of symptoms because they're all going to have the same symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia. So that's why diagnostic tests becomes very, very important. So the first step in diagnostic testing is we want to withhold water. We call that the water deprivation test. So take a look over here. We do the water deprivation test. It's not going to affect this patient over here, the CDI patient. It's not even going to affect the NDI patient, the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus patient. But who does it affect? It affects this primary polydipsia patient. His or her values will start to normalize. The serum osmolality levels will start to increase and the urine osmolality levels will start to increase. And that's awesome because now we just ruled out, we ruled out the primary polydipsia patient, the patient who has an underlying psychiatric issue. Well, how do we tell the other two apart? We still got central diabetes insipidus patient and we got the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus patient. So we deal with the second step in diagnostic testing. And the second step in diagnostic testing, very, very important. Administer antidiuretic hormone. How do you administer antidiuretic hormone? You give antidiuretic hormone in the form of an antidiuretic hormone analog referred to as desmopressin. So you give the patient desmopressin. Now guess what? Luckily for us, one of them will change and one of them will not. So just think about back to the pathology for a second. In central diabetes insipidus, the patient was not able to actually produce antidiuretic hormone because of something happening in the brain. So the antidiuretic hormone analog that we give is gonna benefit the central diabetes insipidus patient. So you give this patient the desmopressin, which is the analog of antidiuretic hormone. Well, guess what? The serum osmolarity for the CDI patient, the central diabetes insipidus patient, it will improve. It will start to go back to baseline. The urine osmolality levels for the CDI patient, that will increase, it will go back to baseline. The nephrogenic diabetes insipidus patient on the other hand, that person, that person had enough ADH being produced in the brain, but for, but for some reason it wasn't acting at the level of the kidneys. So it's not going to help the nephrogenic diabetes patient at all. For nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, again, luckily for us, so that we can actually pick the right answer on the test choice, nothing happens. So that's how we tell we're either dealing with a central diabetes insipidus patient or a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus patient. The next concept is, well now that, that's awesome, we know exactly what's going on, we need to be able to treat all three cases. So let's start off with the most simplest case again. Uh, you know, I, I say simplest because there's not much to do with this patient. Primary polydipsia patient, as we, as we mentioned, he or she has an underlying psychogenic cause. So all we do is we tell the patient not to drink any water. With nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and central diabetes insipidus, we actually have some treatment. So again, with central diabetes insipidus, we learned about some of the causes. These causes don't allow the, uh, the antidiuretic hormone to be released from the brain. So if we continue giving this patient the antidiuretic hormone like we did for the diagnostic testing, that's perfect. Continue giving desmopressin acetate. It's abbreviated DDAVP. You can give this orally, you can give it intranasally, and you can even give it in the form of an injection. So for central diabetes insipidus, continue with the an analog. Well, what happens with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Just like, just like, just like, we always, we always, we always wanna say, treat the underlying cause. That's the very, very first thing you wanna kinda think about. Again, think about it, right? If the medications are causing the issue, see if you can stop the medications. Maybe you can switch to lithium. Maybe, you, maybe the patient doesn't need the mecocycline anymore. See what you can do, stop the medications. The next thing, if it's electrolytes that are causing it, correct the electrolyte imbalance. Hypercalcemia, try to bring the calcium levels down. Hypokalemia, try to raise the potassium levels. And of course, if you got a kidney disease, again, try your best, see what you can do, investigate. And of course, we don't wanna leave these patients just hanging around. We wanna do something that will help their kidneys respond better to antidiuretic hormone. So three different medications have been approved for that. The first one being a thiazide medication called hydrochlorothiazide. The second medication being endomethacin. And the third medication being amyloride. So one of these three medications for sure add in your treatment. It's going to help the patient respond to antidiuretic hormone. Another important concept before we wrap up this lecture. These patients are quite dehydrated right now. When I say dehydrated, they're losing 15, 20, 25 liters of water per day through their urine. So it's not such a such a big deal if you're dealing with a patient who is able to move around, the patient has a support in their house, the patient is in the hospital but they have nurses who are helping them around or doctors, but it's going to become a big deal for someone who doesn't uh, have access to water. 
or if the patient uh, doesn't have the energy to get up out of their seat or their bed. So I'm saying bedridden patients or uh, very sick patients. These patients can actually, actually, actually be very, very dehydrated. And what happens when they're very, very dehydrated? Of course, like we mentioned over here, the serum osmolality levels have increased, but for them, it really, really increases. They got hypernatremia as well. High, high, high sodium levels you definitely 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 want to make sure these patients are still consuming water now what we want to do is a quick recap I'll come around on this side again we talked about how antidiuretic hormone is formed in the supra optic nucleus of the hypothalamus we talked about how it comes down to the posterior pituitary gland the posterior pituitary gland releases a hormone called antidiuretic hormone also called vasopressin and we talked about how it works at the level of the nephrons and if it doesn't work we call the diabetes insipidus we got two main types nephrogenic and central diabetes insipidus the causes of both central as well as nephrogenic are listed right over here neatly for you. What you want to do is you want to keep this third condition in mind, primary polydipsia. With them, you remember there's an underlying psychogenic cause. So what you do next, you get, get, read your table, you see what's going on with your table. If serum osmolality has been increased, urine osmolality has been decreased, you're thinking of central diabetes as well as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. If both your serum osmolality levels have decreased and your urine osmolality levels have decreased, you're thinking of primary polydipsia. Well, how do you tell all of them apart? The first thing again, the water deprivation test, that will take out primary polydipsia. The second thing is you administer antidiuretic hormone. If it improves, central diabetes insipidus. If it doesn't improve, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And for treatment, like we said, for central diabetes insipidus, continue giving the patient desmopressin acetate. If it's nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, treat the underlying cause and add a medication, hydrochlorothiazide, indomethacin, or amyloride. Next week, Monday, we're going to talk about syndrome of inappropriate ADA secretion. So again, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, you know, I want you to like, I want you to subscribe, I want you to share the video, and we will see you next week on Med School Mondays with Promo.